This evening I'm talking about the idea of morphic resonance. And this is a very wide-ranging idea. It has huge numbers of implications. And um, they're all rather shocking from the conventional scientific point of view. The first and biggest of them is that the so-called laws of nature may be more like habits. They're not all fixed. They can evolve. They can change. The laws of nature evolve along with nature, and in fact, they're habits. That's the first point. One of the implications of this is that all species, including humans, draw on a collective memory. Each individual draws on a collective memory and contributes to it. Uh, another implication, perhaps the most shocking of all, particularly in the psychology department, is that ordinary memory works by morphic resonance. They're not stored in your brain. Your brain's more like a receiver that tunes into memories across time. They're not all there inside your head. <coughs> now, as you can see, these are ideas which um, you don't have to be a card-carrying skeptic to have your, your skeptic buttons pushed by these ideas. Um, and, of course, they're unconventional uh, and, to many people, unfamiliar. But I'm hoping to show that these are scientific ideas that lead to a, a completely new way of looking at nature, one which is more naturalistic than the present one, not less, and one which is more evolutionary than the current uh, model of reality, not less. And... Um, so I think that this can be a completely new way of looking at things, and I'm going to show uh, some of the new uh, ways of seeing that it provides. First, I'm going to talk about the historical background, because you can't understand these big <coughs> issues without seeing the whole thing in its uh, context. The idea that the laws of nature are fixed is a very old idea. It goes back to ancient Greece, and a lot of Greek philosophers uh, were influenced by Pythagoras and Plato, who thought that though beyond this world there was a non-material world uh, with eternal truths, especially eternal mathematical truths. And the Platonic notions were incorporated into Christian theology by St. Augustine, uh, who thought that the, uh, so the laws of nature, the platonic forms of everything that exists beyond space and time <coughs> are ideas in the mind of God. In the 17th century, the founding fathers of modern science, Kepler, Galileo, Copernicus, Newton, all believed uh, that, they were, that science was in the business of finding out the eternal mathematical laws of nature which were ideas in the mind of God. They were beyond space and time. They were not material because they were part of the divine nature. In the 18th century and, and the early 19th century, with the growth of atheism and materialism, um, people got rid of God, or some scientists did, but the laws of nature remained there like the ghost of the mind of the god of the world machine. Uh, changeless uh, mathematical laws uh, which determine everything that happens. And these laws went on uh, unquestioned until the 1960s, um, when there was a big shift in cosmology with the Big Bang theory of cosmology. Now, I'm going to come back to that, because the Big Bang theory is the culmination of another strain of thought in, in Western thought that goes back not to the Greeks, but in this case, the Jews. The idea that there's a developmental process in history that history involves a, a development in time towards an end or a goal. For the Jews, uh, the prototypic journey was the journey of the people of uh, Israel out of Egypt through the promised land, uh, through, the, uh, through the wilderness to the promised land. And that was a journey that had a goal, the promised land. Um, and they thought that when they got to the promised land, normal history would come to an end. They'd be in a land flowing with milk and honey, it would be like a restoration of paradise. That's not, of course, what happened, because then as now, the promised land was full of Palestinians. And uh, so it didn't quite work out um, as uh, anticipated. So this future state was, pro it was projected into the future, the coming of the Messiah. Then in the Christian context, the second coming of Christ. There was this idea that history was moving towards a goal. And uh, that gives the idea of progress. Progress literally means moving forwards. In the 17th century, this, uh, this progressive vision was secularized by Sir Francis Bacon. 
um, one of the founding fathers of modern science, and it became uh, one of the foundational myths of science and technology themselves. It, in fact, gave rise uh, to the uh, idea of progress through science and technology, which became the dominant idea among intellectuals by the end of the 18th century. However, this idea of human progress, which was really a secularized form of religious vision, which then took other secular forms in Marxism, in, in the rationalism of the French Revolution, in the Enlightenment project, all of them progressive movements, all based on the idea of human growth uh, uh, and development through science and reason and economic growth. Um, these uh, progressivist movements were confined to the human realm until the middle of the 19th century with Charles Darwin's Origin of Species when uh, an evolutionary vision in 1859, 150 years ago, was extended to the whole of life. Darwin hardly used the word evolution. He usually used the word progress. And so it was really an extension of the idea of human progress to all of life. But it stopped there. For most physicists, um, the idea that the whole universe was progressing seemed absurd. At that time, physics was in the grip of the second law of thermodynamics as a dominant idea, which said, in fact, the opposite of progress was happening. The universe was running down towards a final heat death when it would freeze up forever. So um, it, it really was only in biology that this evolutionary vision uh, got going until 1966, when it took over physics as well. The Big Bang cosmology tells us that the universe began very small, less than the size of the head of the pin, very hot, and it's been growing, cooling, and evolving ever since. Now, all of nature is evolutionary. This vision, originally religious, then secular and, and social, then biological, is now cosmic. So we have cosmic evolution. Now, what about the eternal laws of nature in an evolving universe? Most scientists believe in the eternal laws of nature, not because they've thought about it, but because they haven't. And this is where I think real skepticism comes in. Deep skepticism is to ask questions about things that most people just take for granted. The eternal laws of nature, the minute you begin to think about them in the context of the Big Bang, uh, you come up with the question, well, if they're eternal, then they must have existed before the Big Bang. They're somehow outside space and time altogether. Well, that's clearly metaphysical. You couldn't possibly prove it scientifically. Um, or you might say, well, they all came into being at the very instant of the Big Bang. Possible. Um, but as my friend Terence McKenna used to say, modern science is based on the principle, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. And the one free miracle is the appearance of all the energy in the universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. Um, for those who believe in multiverses, um, they, uh, there are a lot of people around today, including the president of the Royal Society, who believe in a completely evidence-free way that our universe is just one of billions, trillions, quadrillions, even an infinite number of parallel universes that actually exist. Um, all of them with mutant versions of the laws of nature and the physical constants. Um, for those who believe that, somehow at the moment of the Big Bang, our universe was imprinted with the laws and constants it now has. Uh, how they're remembered uh, isn't explained. But that is a conventional view held uh, among some of the most eminent cosmologists in the land. Um, anyway, these all share the idea that laws of nature don't change. But if the universe is evolving, why can't the laws of nature evolve too? The idea they don't change is a hangover from a previous cosmology, a kind of platonic metaphysics, and a particular kind of theology. Um, um, so why shouldn't they evolve? As soon as you ask that question, you realize that the very idea of the laws of nature is questionable. Laws of nature, how anthropomorphic can you get? Only human beings have laws, and only human societies, only civilized societies have laws. Um, in the 17th century, it was an explicit metaphor. God was the cosmic emperor. Uh, he made up and set the laws of the universe, and as the cosmic law enforcement agency, through his omnipotence, made sure everything obeyed them. But that's not the kind of language that works very well in science today. Um, but that's what's implicit by the behind the concept of law. 
if by law we simply mean regularities as discovered by science, then since the universe has evolved, the regularities in it have evolved too. And so we are immediately arrive at the idea of evolving laws of nature. But I think the concept of law is the wrong concept. I think the concept of habit is much better. It's much less human-centered. It's much more organic. And I think it fits better with this view of the, uh, the universe that we now have, an evolutionary cosmos. So basically what I'm suggesting is that the so-called laws of nature are more like habits. Instead of the laws existing in a mind existing that transcends time and space, instead um, the habits evolve within time and space, within the universe, and they depend on a kind of memory within nature. Instead of the universe being amnesic, but governed as, governed as it were by a transcendent mind, it's an organic developing system with its own memory built in. Now, you may think I'm exaggerating the conventional belief in the laws of nature, but I'd just like to make the point that for those who've never thought about this question, it's implicit in the way science is done. The belief that any experiment should be repeatable anywhere, anytime, uh, by anyone, is based on the implicit assumption that the laws of nature are the same at all times and in all places. It's built into the scientific method as a fundamental paradigmatic assumption. Now, what difference does this make? Well, it makes a huge difference to the way we interpret natural phenomena. For phenomena that have been around for a long time, like most of the things physicists study, um, hydrogen atoms, for example, uh, the formation of stars, salt crystals, these kinds of things have been around for millions or billions of years. If they have habits, the habits are now so fixed that you wouldn't notice any change. Uh, they behave as if they're governed by fixed laws. Where the difference shows up is when you look at new phenomena, <coughs> phenomena that have never happened before in the history of the universe. And there, we should be able to see the habits build up. Things should get easier and easier to do the more often they've been done, if they're new phenomena. But not if they're old ones, because there would be the backlog of billions of years, which would swamp any effect we could possibly observe today. Now, it so turns out that you can actually study this in chemistry. Um, and there are situations in chemistry where this seemingly outrageous idea can actually be tested in the kind of nitty-gritty world of empirical fact in chemical laboratories. The conventional view is that the first time you make a new compound that's never existed before, when you crystallize it, um, the way it crystallizes will be determined by the laws of nature, the laws of electromagnetism, quantum mechanics, thermodynamics, and so forth. And therefore, the way it crystallizes the first time, or the thousandth time, or the millionth time, or the billionth time, should be exactly the same. But on the habit principle, if um, you're making a new compound that's never existed before and you crystallize it, there won't have been any of those crystals before, as far as we know. Um, if it's a new compound made in a chemistry lab or in a drug company, for example. Um, so the first time you try to crystallize it, there won't be a habit for the crystals. You have to wait for a new form of crystal to appear. Often it takes years before chemists can get new compounds to crystallize. After you've crystallized it the first time, the next time anyone tries to crystallize it anywhere in the world, there should be an influence from the first crystals. Not a very big one, because there's only one lot of crystals. But it should crystallize a bit more easily. <coughs> the third time, there'd be an influence from the first and the second. Uh, and the fourth time, from the first, second, and third, there'd be a cumulative influence from past crystals. It should get easier and easier to crystallize all around the world as time goes on. A habit will be building up in nature. What do chemists actually find? they find that new compounds are very hard to crystallize. And as time goes on, uh, they get easier and easier all around the world. Sometimes there are compounds that aren't known in a crystalline form at all for years. And then once they've appeared, they sh start showing up uh, everywhere. This happened um, in uh, the drug industry. It's happened several times when what are called allomorphs, different forms of crystals of drugs, one of them in the uh, AZT, a AIDS formulation, um, I've forgotten the name of the compound, I'm sorry to say, uh, I could look it up but in the book, but um, it just, uh, the, it's one of the things, it's a well-known pharma pharmaceutical substance. 
suddenly deviant crystals started showing up in a factory and soon they were everywhere and they couldn't get the original ones again. Suddenly it was like an infection they'd taken over. A another form of the crystal has become like a new fashion. Um, and people weren't trying to get these in other labs, they were trying not to. They had to reformulate the entire drug. They lost billions of pounds because uh, the different allomorph of the crystals has a different solubility. <coughs> this is a serious question in uh, the drug industry. Um, there are whole books on allomorphic crystals and their importance uh, for pharmaceuticals. <coughs> um, anyway, it tends to happen more easily the world over once they've happened in one place. How do chemists explain this? Well, the usual way of explaining it is through anecdotes, which are part of the folklore of chemistry. Chemistry, like any science, has an unwritten folklore which shapes the way people think. And I knew about this because I studied chemistry at one time. Um, and, but I didn't realize that people took these anecdotes quite so seriously. When I first wrote an article about morphic resonance in New Scientist, um, two weeks later, there was a very angry letter from the Professor of Chemical Engineering at Cambridge uh, saying that it was ridiculous to suppose there was any mystery about things crystallizing more readily around the world. Had I never heard of the great chemist Perkins, whose beard was known to harbor nuclei or seeds for almost all known crystallization processes. And this is part of a whole seam of folklore in chemistry, uh, explaining how things wouldn't crystallize. They'd tried for months, then Perkins had arrived. They'd ask him to stroke his beard over the crystallizing dish, and lo and behold, they'd crystallize. So it was believed that this happened because seeds of previous crystals, nucleating new crystallizations, were carried around the world on the beards of migrant chemists. Uh, that is is a seriously entertained hypothesis by chemists. It's never been challenged or except by me as far as I know, but it's just still part of the folklore. If there haven't been any migrant chemists, it's assumed that fragments of previous crystals have wafted around the world uh, in the atmosphere as invisible dust particles and settled out in laboratories. Well, um, possible. Uh, but has it been tested? Well, I'm a skeptic. I want evidence for these assertions. Um, so when I asked for the evidence, I couldn't find any whatever. We certainly know that taking fragments of previous crystals can nucleate crystallization, but whether that explains the whole phenomenon is a completely untested assumption. That's one way this theory could be tested. Things should crystallize more easily if you filter out dust particles and exclude migrant chemists. But it turns out there's an even easier way of testing it with uh, crystals. If the um, habit of the crystal gets stronger, what I call the morphic field, the, the organizing habit of the crystal, if that gets stronger as time goes on, even a fully crystallized substance should have a stronger habit. And it should be harder to break it up. To break up crystals, what you do is heat them up. And they reach a point where the thermal vibration destroys the crystal structure and that's called the melting point. And everybody knows that the melting point of water is zero degrees centigrade and so forth. But if crystals, if newly crystallized substances become more stable, this theory would predict the melting point should rise. Well, when I first thought of this, I was shocked. I mean, although I, I didn't think of this till I'd been really into morphic resonance for five or six years or even more, because I was brought up, I just studied chemistry at Cambridge, and um, you know, melting points are fixed. Everyone knows they're fixed. They're in handbooks of physical constants that every science library has. And, and of course, they're constants. says so on the cover, handbooks of physical constants. Um, so it took me a long time to pluck up courage to ask a chemist, have you ever noticed whether melting points of new compounds go, go up? To my surprise, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, it's quite a common observation. I've often found it myself. So I said to him, well, that's very interesting that you found melting points go up. I said, do your colleagues notice? He said, oh, yes, he said, it's pretty common knowledge. So I said, well, how do you explain it? He said, oh, well, it's quite easy to explain. He said, there's no mystery here and certainly no morphic resonance. Um, he said, uh, what's going on uh, is simply that uh, later formed, when you, when you get better at making a compound, you get purer samples. Impurities lower the melting point. So... Uh, as we get better at making things, they get purer, and so the melting points go up. Oh, it's plausible enough. So I said, well, how do you know the later samples are, in fact, purer? He said, well, they must be, because they've got higher melting points. <laughs> um, so 
Um, that's the state of the art in this particular uh, discussion. But I decided to try and take it further by looking at historical records. Um, I predicted that if I went back through the chemical literature and looked at compounds that crystallize in nature, um, they, that it should be possible to um, find examples uh, of things that crystallize in nature that have been crystallizing for billions of years or millions of years where you wouldn't see a change, however much chemists make them. There might be some effects of purity, but if they keep making these, there, there would be, there'd be such a strong morphic resonance you wouldn't expect this effect, compared with synthetic compounds made on a large scale uh, where you would expect this effect. So I looked at the history of melting points. I had to get out dust-covered volumes, uh, back volumes of... Uh, handbooks of physical constants. The only place I could find them was the patent office library. They were literally dust covered. Because uh, most people aren't at all interested in the past of constants. They're, even though they're not supposed to change, the only handbooks most people use are the current ones. As the, pa the past values are immediately forgotten. And if they differ from the present ones, no one notices. Or if they do, they assume the old ones must have been errors. Anyway, I looked into the history of melting points. What I have here are pairs of compounds. I'm afraid this, the figures are rather small. This, this compound is salicin, and these are the melting points in 1932, 1902, 1940, and 1994. And salicin occurs in willow bark. It's a natural compound. No change in melting point over the 20th century. Aspirin is a synthetic derivative uh, based on that first synthesized in the 19th century. Um, in 1914, 19, middle of the 20th century, in 1994, uh, it went up in melting point by about 14 degrees centigrade. We're not talking here of fractions of a degree. We're talking big effects. Here's penicillic acid, a natural substance in the exudate of penicillium mold, and B, penicillamine, uh, produced in the penicillin industry and present in the urine of people who've been taking penicillin, used also as a collating agent. Uh, that's gone up over the course of the last 50 years uh, by about 10 degrees. And here's cocaine, the naturally occurring alkaloid in coca leaves, um, which has shown no change over the 20th century. And cocaine hydrochloride, the cocaine of commerce, made by extracting coca leaves with hydrochloric acid, doesn't occur in nature. That's gone up by about, again, about 12 degrees over the 20th century. So there seem to be effects here. Now, of course, this is very provocative for people. So this was challenged by a group of skeptics, the Dutch skeptics. They're called Stichting Skepsis. And they challenged this work, and they said, I must have made mistakes and stuff. And they got some chemists to check the figures. And they came up with figures almost the same as mine for the melting points. So then they decided that there must be another explanation. And in the end, they said, well, it just must be because they're getting purer, uh, these particular ones. I was very familiar with that explanation. And I said, well, how does it happen to some and not others? And they couldn't explain that. So anyway, the facts were checked by skeptics, and they came up with the same facts. Of course, they didn't agree with my interpretation. But this is a rich seam of research for any of you interested in the history of chemistry. Um, you could, of course, this would, of course, require testing with proper tests. A proper experiment would involve uh, taking, um, say, six new compounds in one lab, putting them in the deep freeze or uh, store cupboard, taking one of them at random in another lab, making large amounts and crystallizing it in large quantities, which would happen if it were going into commercial production anyway, then take the these six samples out in the first lab, measure their melting points, and that one should have gone up and the other shouldn't. So this could be tested in a simple controlled experiment. It hasn't been done yet because I've utterly failed in persuading any chemists to do this research. Um, but it's very simple, it wouldn't cost much, and it would be a test with huge implications. <laughs> well, um, this principle of memory in nature is what I call morphic resonance. The idea is that similar things influence subsequent similar things on the basis of similarity. They tend to make the same kinds of things happen again. So similarity is the principle, and resonance is the uh, movement across time of information about patterns of vibratory activity, so that any pattern of vibratory activity, which all atoms, molecules, crystals, cells, organisms have, they're all oscillatory or vibratory, um, 
uh, resonate with those that have gone before across space and time. It doesn't fall off with space and time. It doesn't involve a transfer of energy but of information. That's the postulate, right or wrong. That's what I'm suggesting. Um, and I'm further suggesting that in um, biological uh, systems and in chemical systems, the pattern of things is organized by what I call morphic fields. This grows out of a concept that's been well known in biology for more than, 20, uh, more than 100 years, actually, or nearly 100 years, namely morphogenetic fields. Uh, first of all, fields. Fields were first introduced into science by Michael Faraday in London. Um, and the idea was that there are regions of influence in space outside material objects. Here's a magnetic field. You've all seen this many times before. But there's a region of influence that extends beyond the material surface. Fields are not made of matter. They extend beyond matter. And indeed, in modern physics, matter is now thought to be made of fields, energy bound within fields. So fields are mysterious in the sense that they're regions of influence that are physical, yet not material. In the 19th century, they tried to explain electrical and magnetic fields as if they were material in terms of a subtle matter, the ether. But it turned out the ether was an unnecessary concept. So we got back to Faraday's original idea of fields, which is that they're modifications, as he put it, of mere space. They're patterns in space. The gravitational field is a pattern in space, and indeed the whole universe is within the gravitational field. And we have fields in quantum field theory. An <coughs> electron is a vibration in an electron field, a proton in a proton field, and so forth. There's lots of fields, not just one kind. And one of the challenges in physics is to unify these various fields, which is what superstring and M theories are about. They try to unify them in terms of 10 or 11 dimensional theories of reality that go way beyond what any of us can conceive. Um, but nevertheless, that's mainstream physics today. It's moved on so far from 19th century theories of matter that it's barely recognizable. Anyway, this is a field theory. Um, just another example of fields. This shows the uh, magnetic field of the Earth as distorted by the solar wind. <coughs> these are the poles. Uh, and these, uh, this is all the magnetic, and this is the magneto that pours uh, the uh, boundary of the Earth's magnetic influence. So these are field phenomena as well. Now, in embryology, um, a number of embryologists came up with the idea that embryos are shaped by fields. The, why is it the arm and the leg have different shapes when they have the same DNA and the same proteins? That there, that it's like buildings with different architectural plans, that there were fields <coughs> shaping developing organisms called morphogenetic fields, morphe form genesis coming into being. This is a bat embryo, and it's just to remind you of what embryos look like. Um, and the way that these fields, which I call morph morphic fields, is the general word for them, which includes morphogenetic and other forms of fields, is they're organized in nested hierarchies. The field of the whole bat, would be like the outer circle, these would be the fields of the organs, like the limbs or the eyes. These are the tissues within them. These are the cells within those. All of nature is, in fact, organized in this nested hierarchy or holarchy. Uh, they, these could be subatomic particles in atoms, in molecules, in crystals. Uh, they could be... Uh, these could be organisms in a society of organisms, like a <coughs> flock of birds. The larger field could represent this larger <coughs> organized unit. All of nature is organized like this. At every level, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And the question is, what is it? This, what, what is this mysterious wholeness? Well, I'm suggesting it's the morphic fields of each system, uh, which have an inbuilt memory given by morphic resonance. Morphic resonance automatically averages what's happened before. And to get an idea of how it might work, this is an analogy. These are average scientists, an average female, an average male scientist at the John Innes Research Institute in Norwich, uh, made by superimposing photographs. They're composite photos. And what you get is a kind of probability structure of a face. You don't get an exact reinforcement. They're all slightly different. Every crystal, every leaf, every organism is slightly different. So if you average them all, you don't get a sharply defined or, uh, morphic field. You get a blurred outline. It's a probability structure, very like the probability structures in quantum physics. 
Morphogenetic fields were introduced into biology for two reasons. Firstly, to understand what it is that shapes the form of organisms, which is impossible to understand just in terms of genes and gene products, because they don't have any particular form. Even if you switch on genes in the right place in your arm or your leg, uh, making the right proteins doesn't give you an arm or a leg. There's something else is shaping them. Um, that's one reason. The other is that fields are have an automatic holistic property. You can't have a part of a field. If you cut a magnet in half, you don't get one north pole and one south pole. You get two smaller magnets, each with a complete field. If you damage organisms, you get something very similar. This shows uh, a dragonfly egg inside which an embryo has grown. In this case, the egg was cut, tied off with a thread. This part was killed. What happens then is the lower half gives rise to a small but complete embryo um, and rather than just the back half, which it would have done otherwise. If everything was rigorously, mechanistically programmed, it would go on and just produce half a dragonfly. But it doesn't. It adjusts. This is called regulation in the terminology of embryology. And um, it forms a small but complete one. It's a bit like cutting a magnet in half and getting two complete magnets. This is regeneration. Plants do it all the time. You, take, you can take hundreds of cuttings from a willow tree. Each will give you a new willow tree. Um, each part has the, f the field of the whole. This is a flatworm cut into little bits. Each bit can regenerate the rest of the worm. Um, again, this shows, uh, this is a part of the holistic field property of organisms. Uh, one reason for the concept being so popular within developmental biology. These are newts. This is a newt's arm. It's cut off there, and it regrows the rest of the, the hand from the stump. Here it's cut off in the forelimb rather than the, uh, this, this uh, it's cut off in the hind limb, not the forelimb. And again, it regenerates to form a complete organism. And here's one of the most remarkable examples of regeneration, so-called Wolfian regeneration um, of the newt's lens. Uh, in this experiment, the lens is surgically removed from the eye of a newt. And what happens is it regenerates a new lens from the edge of the iris, which is not the way it forms normally. It normally forms from the folding in of skin on the outside, uh, to give rise to a complete new lens. So there's something about the eye that knows what it's meant to look like. There's a kind of plan there, an invisible plan. And that's what, in conventional biology, is thought of in terms of the morphogenetic field. This is a conventional concept. What I've done is taken the concept further by suggesting that they really are a new kind of field and that they have an inherent memory. But the concept of morphogenetic fields you'll find in developmental biology textbooks. I came to this through developmental biology. I spent 15 years working at Cambridge on the development of plants and then in India. And the, um, develop, the way in which plants develop uh, is best understood in terms of morphogenetic fields. Of course, there are chemicals and all sorts of hormones and things. That's what I used to work on. Uh, but this is a central concept in developmental biology. Now, if morphic resonance is happening, it means if you make an organism develop abnormally and it goes on doing it, it should get easier for others to develop <coughs> abnormally in, in the same, with the same kind of abnormality. And here's an example. At the top is a normal fruit fly, Drosophila, which, like all flies, has two wings and two halt hairs, balancing organs. This is a mutant Drosophila, and the more observant of you will have seen that uh, it has four wings, not two. Um, and the uh, extra pair of wings are formed by transforming the halt hairs into an extra pair of wings. This can happen as a result of a gene mutation in the bithorax gene complex. It can also happen if you expose the eggs of fruit flies to ether three hours after they're laid. Some of them develop abnormally like this. It's nothing to do with mutation. It's a bit like thalidomide giving abnormal babies. It's a chemical effect on, on development. It was found in the 1950s by Waddington at Edinburgh University, C.H. Waddington, that if you kept doing this, more and more developed abnormally in response to ether. Um, and if you then took the ether away, they went on giving rise to four-winged flies, even though there hadn't been genetic mutations. 
This was an example of the inheritance of acquired characters, and it was very controversial because that's a taboo topic in biology. But his research was repeated at the Open University by Dr. Mei Wan Ho and her colleagues uh, using an inbred strain of fruit flies. These are the generations. First generation, about 2.5% were transformed by the ether into four-winged flies. Next generation, about 6%. And they went on until the proportion of four-winged flies got much higher. They took the ether away in these so-called relaxation lines, and for generations they went on producing four-winged <coughs> flies, although in declining numbers. It didn't drop back to zero straight away. From the morphic resonance point of view, what's interesting is when they'd done six or seven generations of flies uh, with the ether, they took a new strain, a new batch of flies whose parents had never seen ether, and started doing an experiment with them. The first generation, 10% uh, were transformed, the second 20, whereas the first time round it was two and a half and six. This is the kind of effect you'd expect with morphic resonance. And uh, as I say, this I I data already exists in the literature of developmental biology. This wasn't done to test morphic resonance. It was an anomalous effect that they couldn't explain. The same applies to behavior. And here we're getting closer to psychology. Um, this theory says that the organization of the nervous system is also organized by morphic fields. And this should apply to learning. If you train rats to learn a new trick here in Goldsmiths College, then rats all over the world should be able to learn the same trick quicker just because they've learned it here. If you train thousands, it should be quicker still elsewhere. Uh, this is in the absence of any known means of communication, just by morphic resonance. Now, improbable, you may think, but, and indeed I did when I first thought of it. Um, but I then uh, looked through the archives of animal behavior. The first example I found was astonishingly by Pavlov, the great uh, discoverer of the conditioned reflex. Pavlov trained mice to run to a particular place to feed when they heard a bell. And he measured how quickly they learned by how many trials it, it took before they got it and did it every time. The first generation took 300 trials to learn the second generation took 100, the next took 30, and the one after that took 10. There was an inheritance of acquired characters that was shockingly large. Pavlov could never explain it, so he moved on to something else. But uh, similar work was done with rats. Starting in the 1920s, MacDougall at Harvard uh, trained rats to escape from a water maze, measured how many errors they took, uh, trained their, their, their offspring, and they made fewer errors, and their offspring made fewer errors, just like Pavlov had found. So the skeptics, of course, of his day rightly looked at this to see if there were flaws, and one possible flaw was that he might have been breeding the next generation from the ones that underwent the fastest training, so you could get on with it, uh, and those would be the smarter ones. So he might have inadvertently been suggest uh, selecting for smart rats. So MacDougall said, OK, I'll do it again, but this time, in every generation, I'll select the most stupid rats as the parents, the parents of the next. So the number of errors should go up and up. What did he find? He found that the number of errors went down and down. It went down from more than 200 uh, in the first generation to about 35 in the, 20, uh, in the 22nd generation. There was a huge effect. This was enormously controversial in, uh, before the Second World War and during the Second World War, uh, this piece of research. Um, and several people tried to replicate it, notably um, someone called Crewe at Edinburgh and Agar in Melbourne, Australia. Both of them found their rats took up more or less where McDougall's had left off. Um, but what uh, the uh, Australian experiments were the best done, and what they found was, that, uh, what Crewe found in Edinburgh was some of them learned straight away with no training at all. Um, um, the Australians had a control line where in every generation they trained rats that, whose parents had never been trained. What they found was that both lots got better and better. So it wasn't because of gen genetic modification, otherwise it wouldn't have shown up in the control rats. They were all getting better, exactly what you'd expect on the basis of morphic resonance. But it had no explanation, and so people moved on, and again, these data were just left lying in the scientific literature. It's one of the longest series of experiments ever conducted with animals, with an enormous amount of data, which show a remarkable effect. Well, since my uh, first book, A New Science of Life, first came out, this is the newly revised uh, third edition, completely updated. 
Um, the, I, I got into a, a number of disputes with people who were morphic resonance skeptics. One of them was Stephen Rose, uh, who many of you will know of. He's a um, neuroscientist who was at the Open University. He and I had an exchange about the nature of memory in the columns of The Guardian. And he then publicly challenged me to test what he called this seemingly absurd hypothesis in his laboratory under controlled conditions, i.e. under conditions controlled by him. So I agreed to this, and we set up an experiment which was based on a protocol he was using at the time with day-old chicks. He was looking at conditioned aversion. It's a very rapid form of learning. If you eat something that makes you feel ill, uh, you won't ever touch it again. It'll make you feel sick. You won't want it. This happens with animals. It's a very rapid form of learning. This involved uh, conditioned aversion in day-old chicks. They were exposed not, in this case, to a, f a taste, but to a sight. They were shown a small yellow light, which they tried to peck at. After they pecked at the yellow light, they were made sick with lithium chloride, and they'd never after touch a yellow light. They had a control stimulus, a chrome-plated bead. Uh, after that, they were given an injection of saline solution. It didn't make them sick, and they're perfectly happy with chrome beads. I predicted that if you did the same thing day by day, with fresh batches of day-old chicks, that relative to the controls, um, future generations uh, of chicks should get more and more averse to pecking at the yellow light. There should be a conditioned aversion carried by morphic resonance to chicks with no previous experience. We did the experiment. These are the results. Um, there was a, a significant increase in the proportion of chicks not picking, pecking at the yellow light. Rose and I had agreed to publish it together. Uh, when he saw these results, he didn't want to. And so I published the uh, results, and he then wrote a rejoinder, and I wrote a reply. And you can read all this. It's online on my website if you want the details. He criticized this interpretation for a variety of reasons. And I won't go into all the forwards and backwards of it, but these are the results as they appear uh, in, 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 in over the starting with the third um, generation of chicks. So there are a lot of ways in which you can test morphic resonance um, in the human realm. This should suggest that humans would find it easier to do things others have done before, learning skateboarding, snowboarding, computer programming, playing video games, etc. Is that true? Well, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence it is, but of course, as everybody here will immediately think, there are lots of other variables that could be affecting it. So to test the theory in the human realm, you have to do one of two kinds of experiment. Either new field tests, where you, s you study the rate at which people learn a new task, um, and then you get lots of people to do it, and you see whether os others can learn it more quickly. Or old field tests, where you test people to see if they can do more easily than you would otherwise expect things that millions of people have done in the past. And I'll give examples of both of those. The first new field test that was done uh, was suggested by my friend and long-standing sparring partner, Nicholas Humphrey, who is a psychologist but a skeptic. And um, he suggested a very rapid form of learning, uh, which is the looking, at, uh, looking at puzzle pictures. This is a puzzle picture. There's an embedded image here, uh, which you may not see. You probably won't, because this is a deliberately designed to be difficult. And when I show you the answer, and go back to the original. You probably get it. I'm sure most people here will have got it now. It's very rapid learning. If you see that again in 10 years' time, you get it straight away. It's instant learning. Very good for an experiment. Uh, uh, um, so how many people got it first time round? Three? Yes, three or four. That's about the right, right proportion. I mean. Um, in this experiment, it was done first on ITV, then on BBC um, television. Uh, we had two specially prepared hidden images. Um, one of them was selected on the program at random, and it was shown to millions of viewers here in Britain. And they were then shown the answer, so they all got it. Meanwhile, in Germany and other countries, we tested groups of people before and after the British TV program uh, with the two images to find out what proportion got them. The prediction was, relative to the control, the proportion recognizing the hidden image should increase. And it did. It increased statistically significantly. 
there are areas of existing data uh, where we can look at uh, the possible effects of morphic resonance, and one is with IQ tests. This is one of the very few areas where the same tests have been done year after year after year. Every year the data are normalized to 100, so the average is taken as 100. But I would predict that the average score in IQ tests should be going up year by year, not because people are getting smarter, but because so many people have already done the test, they're getting easier to do by morphic resonance. When I first predicted this in the 1980s, I couldn't get my hands on IQ test data, and I didn't know how to test this. But I was therefore fascinated when it turned out that um, a psychologist called James Flynn uh, looked at data from Japan and America to start with, and then in many other countries, and found what is now called the Flynn effect, uh, which shows a large increase in I average IQ test scores um, this, over the 20th century. This is from 1918 to 1989. This is a big effect. It's been f found in many other countries as well. It's not because people are getting smarter. It's somewhat analogous to the topic of grade inflation, um, although this is a much better controlled uh, system because the marking in the tests are standardized. Um, What's going on? Um, there's been a huge debate among psychologists to try and explain this. There are no satisfactory explanations that satisfy everyone. Flynn himself has confessed to be baffled by it. But it's just what you'd expect on the basis of morphic resonance. I say this not because I think this is enough to convince you of a highly improbable seeming idea, but because the circumstantial evidence such as it exists does point in this direction. Now, of course, we need proper tests, and several have been done. Uh, perhaps the most ingenious was suggested by my older son when he was doing GCSE uh, exams. One day, he said to me, uh, he said, I and my friends have just thought of a great way of getting extra marks without doing extra work. And I said, how? He said, by morphic resonance. And I said, well, how will you do that? He said, we're going to do the last two questions first, and then go back to the first and second and third question. We'll be 10 minutes behind everyone else in Britain, so we get a boost by morphic resonance. Um, and I said, well, some of your friends must have been morphic resonance skeptics. What did they say? They said, he said, they said, what if morphic resonance doesn't exist? He said, we worked out if it doesn't exist, we wouldn't lose anything. But if it does, we'd gain extra marks. Well, they all got A stars, but um, of course, they probably would have got them anyway. I can't claim that as evidence either, but it's a very good idea. The whole GCSE system could be turned into a vast morphic resonance experiment by changing the order of some of the questions and then giving them at random to people in the country and seeing if there were these kinds of effects. So these are not impossible to test. They could be done with Sudokus, they could be done online with all sorts of online puzzles and so forth. They would apply to video games if you could test them before they were released in one country and then afterwards they were released somewhere else to see if that game got better and another one didn't. There's lots of easy to do student project level tests in morphic resonance. And student projects have in fact been done mostly in the other kind of test which are what I call old field tests which is where you look to see if things that millions of, year, millions of people have done over the years make it easier today. I think this may apply to language learning in general. Chomsky and his school have argued that children learn language so fast there must be an innate component to learning language. But because they think innate equals genetic, they then have to postulate a grammar common to all languages with genes for this in all children, Chinese, Japanese, English, Scandinavian, uh, because they can all learn any language uh, at an early age. Morphic resonance provides a much simpler explanation than these hypothetical and uh, so far undetected grammar genes. Um, it means that you'll just tune into the language by morphic resonance and learning will be facilitated by morphic resonance. Now, reading and writing should work that way too, and many of the tests that have been done to test this theory have been done with reading and writing. One of the first was done by Professor Gary Schwartz, who was then Professor of Psychology at Yale University. Um, this was in the 80s. He did a test involving Hebrew words. He took three-letter words from the Hebrew Old Testament, um, written in Hebrew. He took common words and rare words. Then for each of these words, he made an anagram by muddling the letters up. So you've got, still got three letters, but they were non-words. Like in English, cat, C-A-T, is a word, but T-C-A is not a word. 
So he made non-words and real words. He then showed, he randomized them, and he showed them to people who d said they didn't know Hebrew. He asked them to guess the meaning of each word projected on a screen, um, the English meaning of each word. Um, and after they'd guessed, he asked them to estimate the confidence they felt in their guess. Well, what he found was that a few people guessed right. So he eliminated them on the grounds they might have known some Hebrew um, uh, or been exposed to it in some way. So anyone who guessed right was excluded from the experiment. Only those who guessed wrong. What he found was there was a very significant effect whereby uh, people who guessed the real words uh, felt more confident in their guess than those who guessed the false words. And what's more, this effect was stronger with the common words than the rare words. A remarkable result. And um, he then ran the experiment through again. This is the second time round. He said to people, some of these are real and false words. When you see each one, I ask, want you to judge which is real and false. They were no better than chance. They'd done unconsciously what they couldn't do consciously, namely discriminated between real and false words in a language they didn't know. There have been many projects uh, along these lines uh, with language. The most recent was done last year at the University of Northampton by Chris Rowe and one of his students um, using Chinese characters. Um, and again, they found a similar kind of effect. There have been probably eight or nine of these projects, some of them done in considerable detail, mainly in Germany, um, involving language. So um, here are ongoing um, tests in this area of morphic resonance. They're all summarized together with tests in other areas uh, in this new edition of my book, um, wh where I also propose some new experiments uh, to test for morphic resonance, cheap, simple experiments that could really make a difference. This leads to the idea of collective memory, uh, which I mentioned right at the outset. In psychology, Jung, among others, has proposed that uh, all human beings draw upon a collective memory. And um, morphic resonance would mean that if the idea didn't already exist, you'd have to invent it. But Jung thought of it as just a human collective memory. He could never explain how it worked, which is why his ideas are treated with deep suspicion in academic circles. But I'm suggesting the same thing would happen in all species, in fact, in all nature, this kind of collective memory phenomenon. Now, this depends on similarity. The greatest collective memory would come from those who are most similar to you in the past, members of your family or people of similar uh, cultural background, because this, this would apply to the transmission of cultural forms. It's slightly similar to Richard Dawkins' idea of memes. The morphic fields of cultural units would spread by morphic resonance. Um, of course, he wouldn't think that they spread that way at all, but the, the idea is a somewhat similar idea. Um, but it depends on similarity, and the people who are most similar to each other are identical twins. Therefore, there should be maximum morphic resonance between identical twins. If they're separated at birth, things that one do should influence the other, and there should be extraordinary parallels in their lives that make no sense in other terms. Well, as you all know, identical twin studies are the basis of the nature-nurture debate, um, and this raises tremendous passions because uh, it affects people's political views. Are, are we shaped by our genes at birth, or can we be modified by education and social upbringing? Left-wing people tend to prefer the modification theory. It's more optimistic. Right-wing people, the, the, the genetic determinism view. And huge edifices of political theory have been based on the slender foundations of these identical twin studies. Some of them show that <coughs> some twins separate at birth, call their children by the same names. I mean, extraordinary coincidences like that. Hardly likely to be programmed in DNA. Um, uh, but nevertheless, they're taken as evidence for genetic determinism. They've favored the g genetic determinism interpretation of selfish genes and sociobiology for several decades now. If morphic resonance is happening, they can be interpreted in a completely different way, uh, which uh, greatly softens this nature-nurture contrast and undermines a lot of the evidence for genetic determinism. Finally, um, if I ask the question, um, what, which organism in the past is most similar to you now? Then, if you think about it, the answer is going to be 
yourself. You're more similar to yourself in the past than to anybody else. Therefore, the most specific morphic resonance working on you from the past will be from your own past. And that means that you'll have a kind of memory system based uh, on, on uh, morphic resonance that doesn't depend on storing uh, the memories inside the body. If you get into a similar state to one you've been before, you'll resonate with yourself in the past by morphic resonance and, and pick up those memories. That, I think, is how memory works. And everybody here has been brought up to believe that memories are stored inside the brain in modified synapses or DNA or RNA or phosphorylated proteins. There's many, many theories of memory storage. Uh, but one of the most interesting facts about memory research is how unsuccessful it's been. For more than 100 years, people have tried to find memories in the brain. They've tried desperately hard. Billions of dollars have been spent on this attempt. Vast numbers of people have spent their careers trying to do it. And of course, they found some interesting and important things about memory. Um, but the attempt to find the memory traces has been frustrated over and over again. They've proved elusive. Um, they've never been able to pin them down. And I think that's for the same reason that I couldn't find, if I tried to find out what you'd watched last night on TV and came and analyzed your TV set, <coughs> I wouldn't find traces of yesterday's dates. He trained rats to do tricks, cut out different bits of their brains to find out where the memories were stored. was astonished to find that uh, you couldn't eliminate the memories by, by cutting out the right side, the left side, the lower bit, the upper bit, and so on. It didn't seem to matter which bits you cut out, they still remembered. Of course, if you cut the whole brain out, then they couldn't do very much. Um, that showed the brain was somehow necessary for memory, but uh, um, the, he couldn't find the traces. And he said, I believe the evidence strongly favors the view that amnesia from brain injury rarely, if ever, is due to the destruction of specific memory traces. Rather, the amnesias represent a lowered level of vigilance, a greater difficulty in activating the organized pattern of traces, or a disturbance of some broader system of organized functions. His student, Carl Pribram, um, suggested that memories are stored holographically in the brain to account for the problem of localizing them. And Eric Kandel, whose work on the sea slug Aplysia and on memory in mice and other animals, um, it won him the Nobel Prize in 2000, has also um, spoken out about how difficult this is to, to, to find the memories. The difficulty in mammals, in the mammalian brain, as Pat Candell and others have shown, um, is that when learning's going on, associative learning, the hippocampus is very active. And if you uh, take out the hippocampus, th the organisms can't learn. Uh, so it's very active, there are changes in the nerve cells, there's long-term potentiation and so forth. All of these things are documented in detail. The hippocampus is certainly involved in the formation of memories. But once they've formed, you can cut the hippocampus out and they can remember everything perfectly. Um, so the standard hypothesis is, okay, well, the traces are laid down in the hippocampus, but then later, they're moved somewhere else in the brain, but we don't quite know where yet. This is how Kandel uh, uh, explained it. How do different regions of the hippocampus and the median temporal lobe interact in the storage of explicit memory? How is information in these regions transferred for ultimate consolidation in the neocortex? We do not, for example, understand why the initial storage of memory requires the hippocampus, whereas the hippocampus is not required once the memory has been stored for weeks or months. So, I say this to illustrate that memory is a big problem. It's not as if it's all figured out. There's no need for something like morphic resonance. It's a deep mystery, a refractory mystery, that despite lots and lots of investigation and effort, have proved, uh, it has proved very, very hard to explain. And I think this provides a completely different take on it. And um, I'm a skeptic of standard memory theories. And I think given that they've had such a poor track record in explaining the phenomenon for more than 100 years, it's worth trying an alternative approach. Now, there are some people who say, no, we should never try alternative approaches because they must be stored in the brain. Everybody knows they've got to be stored in the brain. That's a paradigmatic assumption. That's just the kind of thing we should be skeptical about. Um, so I'm not saying I'm right, they're wrong, or they're right, and I'm wrong. I'm saying it's an open question. It's a very, very big open question at the very center of psychology. 
Well, finally, um, this view of habits of nature, which has so many implications for so many branches of science, uh, doesn't explain evolution by itself. It explains how things get repeated. Evolution has to be an interplay of habit and creativity, just like our own lives are an interplay of habit and creativity. If we just had creativity, nothing would ever stabilize. If we just had habit, nothing new would ever happen. Um, I think morphic resonance helps explain the question of habit. It leaves the source of creativity open. <laughs> there are a lot of different possible theories of creativity. Um, but this theory doesn't commit to one or the other of them. It leaves that completely open. But it does give a completely different view of the entire evolutionary process. One which I said at the beginning is more naturalistic, not less so, than the conventional scientific theory with these mysterious laws of nature beyond space and time. Uh, this is more naturalistic and more radically evolutionary. Whether it's right or not, time will tell. But there's just a brief summary, and I hope it's enough to give you some sense of what this idea is about. Thank you.